First of all, I just want to thank you for coming. Um, and I believe uh, Kim, who just seemed to have disappeared. Oh, there you go. Uh, okay, I believe everyone is in their seat. So I think uh, before we hear anything more from me, let's take a look at a video. The most important thing that, that kids and people want from us is that we care about them as a person and to teach them that you do not have your self-worth connected to your skill level in something. They're two separate issues. You're a beautiful human being, you're fantastic, and that's it, and that's all that matters. It doesn't matter if you're ranked, you know, number 250,000 in the world or number one, that does not matter. Yes, there are expectations. Yes, there are great demands. But yes, we realize you're a human being. A lot of times, what they need is love and just the positive reinforcement. This is something we all are in together as a family. If you can be positive about what they're doing out there, they will listen. I can get far more out of my players if I'm doing it with a smile on my face, with energy in my voice, I'm being clear in what I want from them, and I'm letting them know that I believe in them. Being positive on a daily basis, you, you have a choice. You make a choice of you know, the glass is half full or the glass is half empty. You make a choice of bringing negative or positive to, to a meeting, to a relationship, to a basketball court, or to you. PCA is one of the greatest organizations that I've ever been affiliated with. I think having fun creates good team chemistry. I get a better response, better effort. We're going to be in their corner. We're going to be supportive. Because I am demonstrating through my positivity, my joy, my excitement, that I believe in them. It is crucial for coaches to send that message. Every moment is a teaching moment. You can help a child or a person believe in themselves. It's, it's everything. Certainly that gives you a nice flavor about, in part, why we're here tonight. Uh, again, my name is Eric Eisenbeth. I'm the lead trainer for Positive Coaching Alliance for the whole country, but I'm based in the uh, Northeast in New England. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, uh, and, and I really appreciate you making the time, because I think this is such a really important topic. I, I'm a parent. I have a boy girl. Twins are 22, and I have a daughter uh, that played uh, sports, two different sports, lacrosse and rowing, and coming up just seeing the, the impact that, that sports had on her as an identity and just as a social opportunity. And uh, for all of you dedicating your time tonight, and uh, more than just tonight, but as a lifetime to help, I think is a noble cause. So just really quickly to give you a, a base about what Positive Coaching Alliance is, our motto is better athletes, better people. We're probably the largest character development and sports performance-based organization in the entire country. We were founded at Stanford University back in 1998. Woo! There you go. <laughs> Out of the Robley gym, uh, which is a very sort of small niche type of, of, of environment, if you will, and it's now expanded to over 15 chapters. Uh, we, we do 2,500 uh, 2, live workshops a year, impact 80,000 coaches annually, have 1.5 million hits to the PCA dev zone, which anyone, if anyone's ever been to the PCA workshops, it's my same joke every time. But they, Positive Coaching Alliance dev zone is sort of like WebMD. Anyone ever go on WebMD? Okay, so it's the WebMD of coaching, but every ans answer doesn't tell you that you're dying. So, uh, you know, if you have a situation you know, with an unmotivated kid or difficulty with parents, things like that, it's, it's very helpful as well. So, um, in my own role, I've actually presented 1,045 workshops. I've done more workshops than anyone in the history of the organization. I only mention that because I've learned something every single time and the opportunity to, to work with kids. Uh, one of our uh, funders in Houston even said, I, I don't even like sports, but I love kids. And so he became an investor in PCA because over 40 million kids play. And, and Julie, you may know this already, but in working with the Olympics, I found that they did a study that found that 80% of women who manage 100 people or more played high school sports. And so when we talk about leadership, we talk about life, uh, life skills. So just, it's such a fertile ground to, to talk about it. So really that's the role for PCA. So then understanding the merging of PCA and Yale, is understanding a bit how this relationship started. And for me, on a personal note, I actually was going to do a workshop and I had pneumonia. And I was coughing and coughing and coughing. And I was given a heads up that somebody who I didn't know was going to come watch a workshop. And who comes in but a very tall, regal-looking woman with glasses. 
and, uh, and a young man whose smile would light up a room and was wearing a Georgia Tech polo shirt, and it was Kim and Alex. And suddenly I went from, oh gosh, I have pneumonia, to this better be good. And uh, because I think anyone knows, if you ever need to get to Tom, to get to Tom, you got to get through Kim. So fortunately, things went well. Kim was just instrumental in bringing PCA to the Guilford community, and I see people from Guilford here as well, um, and then really saw the power of that. And that's when, frankly, Tom, you and I had those opportunities to talk. And you used, frankly, us, if you will, as an instrument to help your vision. And it's just like kids, you're never supposed to say you like one of your kids more than the others, and we have a lot of partners. But since we're here and nobody's recording, right, I will say that the Yale relationship, certainly professionally for me, has been the most rewarding and most comprehensive relationship we have as an organization. And, and it really is because of you, Tom. We have met with your student athletes. We have met with the Kipseth, I always say that wrong, organization. We've met with your coaches. We've hosted youth sports at Ingalls Rink. We've met at the golf course. We are here tonight, and you are always sitting front and center. And, you know, some of us remember E.F. Hutton, people old enough to remember E.F. Hutton? This man has so much gravitas that when Tom Beckett speaks, E.F. Hutton listens. So, I just... <laughs> so, not only have you provided, you know, 23 years of leadership to Yale, but really, with, with Kim, seriously, all the way supporting us, that have really allowed us a huge entrance point all around the country into college, colleges, and, and, and frankly, youth, too. When you mentioned that we, we work with Yale, it, it's really opened so many doors. So, uh, you know, really with that. Also, and Julie, uh, I've only really met you personally just one time, but again, in the 1,045 workshops, I played your sound bites probably 1,012. So uh, I really can't thank you enough. They were for different audiences. They were not worthy. So anyway, thank you all for coming, and thank you, Kim, and everybody, for, and Julie, for making the time. So with that, I'd like to introduce Tom. Thank you, everyone. This is very special for us. The person that he's been referring to is my wife, and the young man, Alex, is our son. Alex has an intellectual disability. He's the happiest person I know. He's taught me more things than I will ever learn. He's 23 years old as of yesterday. And when he wakes up every morning, all he can think about is getting to work to be with his friends. He wants to come home and tell his mother and me about what a beautiful day he had. So you talk about being happy you talk about bringing joy every day to what you do. That's what coaches can do for young people. That's what PCA has done for America. That's what Julie Fowley has done for the world. We have an opportunity to do things in our lives, to change the way people interact. And that opportunity is rare, especially for a coach. You influence a young person every single day. The PCA motto is if you need to say something that is critical or something that is going to correct the behavior of a student that you're working with, you need to come back with five positive comments. It works. I've asked our coaches to think about that. We work with our university and reaching out to the community. You can make a difference. So I thank PCA and the folks that we have developed these relationships with. It has changed our world. So I have some things to do here to thank our committee. I would like to announce the entire committee. I'm going to announce our sponsors. So if you could hold for the committee members and then applaud at one time at the end. Ed Mokas, a member of our committee, Jessica Shabrez, Shabrez, Shrebez. Jessica Shrebez. Where is Jessica? Please forgive me. I, I was gonna I was gonna spell this phonetically on this sheet. I said, I got it. I just know. Look at me. Forgive me. Christian Bray, Pat O'Neill, Duke Diaz, Ann Gotze, 
and that young lady by the name of Kim. If all those folks would stand, please thank the committee. So our sponsors, I would like to thank them. And once again, I'll go through the list. We have 11. I want to thank them individually, and then we could ask them to stand and thank them. From Under Armour, our partner that we just started with this past year, they have been spectacular. Attica Alexis Jax is here. From WTNH, News Channel 8, Rich Graziano, the general manager. From Fusco Builders, Lynn Fusco, the Executive Vice President. Amalgamated Bank, Executive Vice President, Dwayne Crisco. Stony Creek Brewery, that's where my son worked. <laughs> Ed Crowley, President. Bascom Barton Distributors, President, Gene Seppi. Coca-Cola, Brian Curry. Torello Tire Company, Nick and Sherry Torello. We have Sweat Cosmetics, Boston Breakers, and Gronk Fitness. Will all of those sponsors please stand? Thank you so very much. So I'm told that the silent auction is going to close at 7.30. Oh, is it after 7.30? Okay, we'll, we'll open it, we'll keep it open a little bit longer. This is why you're here, an American hero. Got to know this young lady as a teenager. It's a freshman at Stanford, I was there at the time. We hit the jackpot at Stanford recruiting this superstar. She put the Stanford soccer program on the national stage and then in two years, she put soccer, American soccer, on the global stage as she joined the U.S. national team and went to China and won a gold medal in the first ever Women's World Cup. After graduating from Stanford, she continued her efforts to work on the national team and continue to perform brilliantly around the world. She's won four gold medals. I told you about the first one in China, the World Cup. She won a gold medal again at the Olympics in Atlanta. She won a gold medal, that was 1996. She won a gold medal again in the World Cup, the Rose Bowl just happened to be 90,185 people attended that game. I told Julie that the Yale Bowl is the grandfather of the Rose Bowl, and she said, really? She walked out and she said, I think you're right. <laughs> she won another gold medal in 2404 in Athens at the Olympic Games. She has 272 appearances on the world stage as a member of the U.S. national team. She's 17 years a member of the team, 13 times she's been elected captain of a team with the greatest soccer players in the world as her teammates. She's in the Hall of Fame at Stanford. She's in the Hall of Fame of the National Soccer League, and you talk about now giving back. So in 1996, Julie applied and was accepted to Stanford Medical School. MCAT scores off the chart, decides maybe this is the right thing for my family. So you're allowed to defer. You get admitted to professional schools in our university systems, you're allowed to defer. So the first time she made that decision, it was probably a little easier to say, I'm not ready. So you're only allowed to defer twice. And she did. She said, I don't think medical school is right for me. But I'm trying to explain to you what kind of an intellect we have here, what kind of a person we have here, what kind of a leader we have here, what kind of an extraordinary human being. 
I've had this opportunity to work with her before. She is a difference maker. President Bush asked her to review our Title IX guidelines. There was a report submitted by her committee. There were 14 people on that committee, very prominent, important people. Julie didn't agree with the report, and she filed along with Donna De Verona a minority report. And the Secretary of Education agreed with Julie Fowdy. So when I asked her if she would come back and help us, she said, sure, I'd love to do it. I have an assignment in Connecticut. I'm going to be doing a game. I have a book signing. I said, whoa, Julie, I need another book. So Aaron, can you hand me? So Julie Fowley is now not just a gold medalist, a mom, a wife, a leader, a difference maker. She's an author. And the company that published this book said, this is for young girls and women. I'm giving this first book to our head football coach. I've read it. This book talks about making choices, living a life of making a difference, finding your voice, doing things to positively influence those around you. This is a masterpiece, Julie Fowdy. It is my pleasure to introduce one of the most approachable, kindest, superstars I have ever met, Julie Fowdy. Dang, Tom, that's like the nicest intro I've ever got. I was almost in tears. Do I have to stand behind this podium to talk, or can I wander? I have to stand. I'm here. Um, Kim, is it okay if I bring Tom to every speech I make and he can introduce me? Seriously, that was so nice. Thank you. I greatly appreciate it. Um, I like to tell my kids I'm not just an author, Tom. I'm a very important author. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, Mom, we know. Uh, but thank you for your kind words. I, um, when Tom uh, asked me and Kim asked me to, uh, would you be interested in coming out to Yale? When Tom asks, as I'm sure all of you are familiar with, Everyone I know who knows Tom is like, yes! So I was like, when do you need me? Um, and so, and the Positive Coaching Alliance, as, as Eric and Tom were talking about, is an organization that is about everything that I value and love about sports and life and lessons. I mean, it literally personifies my experience with the national team for, for so many years. Um, and a lot of it is very similar to what you're going to find in the book. And it's done in a fun way because, and I don't know about you, I have two young kids who are 8 and 10. And when I walk around the soccer fields or, you know, basketball gym, it's all very intense. And it's very serious. And there's parents screaming on the sidelines. And I was like, what is going on here? It's just sports. Right? It's so intense. And so I think, it, it, you know, there's so much pressure already on the kids. And it's us crazy parents. Uh, that often cause it. Um, so really, what I love about Positive Coaching Alliance is it's about bringing sanity back to youth sports, really, and finding the joy. I mean, there, and I'll talk about it before we get into our sock talk, but you know, th that's why they couldn't kick us off the national team in the end, because we were having so much fun. I mean, that's the one thing people always ask, what do you miss the most? And I think they're going to say, oh, you know, that game in 1999 World Cup or the Olympics. And I say, I miss the laughter. I miss hanging out with my friends on a daily basis, like being around them and being around not just amazing athletes, but most importantly, amazing human beings. So, um, so we'll start right there. I'm going to give a little quick keynote, and then we're going to bring these awesome women up to do a sock talk. Because as you'll see in the book, um, we do sock talks where we kick our shoes uh, off, feet up. Uh, they promise they're going to wash their socks for you guys tonight. And thankfully, the television isn't scratch and sniff TV, so you're going to be OK. Uh, but one of the things, and I, I talk about in the very beginning of the book, when I was in, probably in college, 
um, a woman on the national team introduced a quote to me that said, success isn't a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. And now I was in college when I saw this and I was like, what? You mean I get to decide? Success isn't a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. And uh, I, at the time, was surrounded, thankfully, by all these amazing women on the national team and on my soccer team. I didn't go to the great Yale University. I went to the Yale of the West, to Stanford, as Tom was talking about. Um, but what I realized is that if you swapped out success with leadership isn't a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice, it made great sense. And, and, and that's because I had grown up with um, the idea that leadership is, uh, you know, a, a person in a position of power. And it's usually, you know, what I was reading about in history books was a man on a horse with, you know, a tall hat and sword. And I did not have a tall hat and sword and I wasn't a man. Uh, or it was someone who, you know, was a president or a politician and I was none of those things. And so I grew up thinking it was this really narrow definition. Uh, and then I got around all these amazing women and I'm watching them lead in all these different ways. You know, Mia Hamm, who you might have heard of. She was pretty good. Um, she was, I, the for being the superstar in the face of the team, she was so quiet and shy and she hated to get up in front of people and talk and she wasn't going to be the one in the middle of the huddle like pounding her chest, you know, pounding on the locker rooms. That wasn't her style. But what I realized, and that was more my style, which I know is surprising, Loudy Fowdy was my nickname. Uh, <laughs> um, but what I, what I realized is that Mia was a wonderful listener, right? Mia was wonderful at personally connecting with people in a private way. So I have these great images of her walking off the field with you know, her arm around Abby Wambach, who was a young player at the time coming on the national team. And she'd be talking to her as they're going to the locker room and I know they're discussing, you know, how they can do a better job up front together or what she's noticing. And that's how she led. You know, Joy Fawcett, who played on the national team with me for 18 years, had three kids, by the way, as she was playing, she'd literally pop out a kid and then two weeks later would be like, hey, I'm ready to go. I'm like, what? What's wrong with you? And literally after every kid, she'd get back faster and faster. She'd like, you know, two hours later, let's go. I said, I cannot wait to see you at eight kids. What your life? Her husband cut her off at three, though. Uh, but Joy Fawcett literally for the first 10 years on the national team did not say a word. And to the point where I thought something was wrong with her. <laughs> I was like, what is wrong with her? She never talks. I know I'm loud, but... And, and she was one of those really cerebral, she was in the back reading a book, she was quiet, but my gosh, when you got around team building with Joy Fawcett, we do all these crazy fun team building things. And team building is, of course, you're having to, you know, get in a crazy situation and you're having to sort and figure it out and help your team be the first, you know, to get across the line or whatever the challenge is. And Joy would come alive in team building. All of a sudden, she'd be like, you, here, you, here. OK, three people here, five people here. And she'd start like with, with incredible brevity, something I've never really experienced. And she would be you know, so on it. In, in fact, like we would like crave Joy on our team for any of those things. And so we, what we realized quickly is when Joy speaks, everyone would stop talking. Like, Joy's speaking. <laughs> Listen now, because it's not going to last very long. Um, and Joy became my co-captain the last four years we were on our team. You know, so going from a player who you know, didn't talk for the first 10 years to being a co-captain was a really uh, wonderful thing for me to see. Because again, I had thought you needed to be at the top of the mountain shouting down, right? And now I'm looking at all these incredible ways that these people led. Christine Lilly, who's from right here in Wilton, Connecticut, she was one of those players that you just wanted to clone because she worked so hard, was always the fittest. You know those beep tests? Do you guys still do those beep tests? Where you run in and you have to hit the line by a beep and it was like this crazy fitness and you basically did it till you passed out. Or, or you know, Anson used to always say, you're not gonna die, you'll pass out first, I promise. <laughs> Thanks, coach. Uh, and Lil would be, you know, running like 22 laps and we're done at like 11, right? And she just keeps going. And, and so good and so understated. 
never was about her. It was about the team. Um, and again, a, a very quiet leader versus a Brandy Chastain who was like the Energizer Bunny, you know, and this contagious ball of energy. And so I'm playing on the national team and I'm watching all these different styles and how important it is to have all those different styles on a team, right? Imagine if it was just a bunch of talkers, like me and an Abby Wambach. You know, Abby never stops talking, bless her soul. We once got her a shirt that said, help me, I'm talking and I can't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but, or if you had, you know, all quiet people and no one ever said anything and you need this balance. Um, and, and, and that was the really cool thing I discovered is leadership isn't a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. But what I have also discovered in, in these years of now coaching women with our leadership academies and young girls is that we women especially, and I, and I know this isn't just a woman thing, but we women are really good at this, at underselling ourselves, right? At being the ones that are gonna raise our hand. Uh, because we want to, and it's what I love most about women, we want to check all the boxes and we want to be prepared and we're going to be really disciplined and we're going to take that class. We're going to take another 20 classes to make sure we have the skill set. And then we're going to say, okay, I'm ready. Well, guess what? By the time you raise your hand, that opportunity is long gone, right? And we're hesitant sometimes. And it, and it drove me crazy, which is really one of the reasons for this book is I'm watching these seemingly really confident women uh, and yet when they're asked to raise their hand and take that step forward or get out of their comfort zone, all of a sudden I see them retreating. And I'm like, why? Why are we retreating? Right? And, and I remember this was another great lesson I learned from my teammates, and it's the beauty of sports, and it doesn't need to be a national team to learn this, right? That whenever we doubted something, I mean, when we, you know, Tom mentioned the first World Cup in 1991. When I got on the national team in the 80s, it was really the first generation of that national team there was no Women's World Cup. There was no women's soccer in the Olympics. And we were these feisty teenagers who said, why? Why don't we have those things? Why not? And people would look at us and be like, Dad, come on, stop talking such nonsense. You're crazy. Not enough people play soccer in this country. Girls don't play in other countries, right? You're never going to get in the Olympics. Women's soccer? And we kept going, why? Why not? And we could have easily said, yeah, you're right. That's a crazy dream and, and you know, carried on. But no, we had these, this amazing group of women who kept going, why not? Why not? Let's go. Let's do this. And what we said to each other, which I think is one of the greatest lessons I learned, is we're not crazy, we're courageous. And that you have to have that team around you, that dream team, that when you, you know, raise your hand or you say, I've got this dream or I have this you know, great idea, how many times in life do we have those friends who are like, oh, good one. That's stupid. <laughs> What? That's lame, right? And especially with young kids, you know, we, we could be brutal with each other, even adults, of instead of like, yeah, that's awesome, go on. And that's what I had. I had a team. And so when any of us doubted, there was always, because there are going to be moments of doubt, of course, there was always someone who was there saying, no, you're fine, go on. We're going to do this together. And when you feel like you have a dream team around you, oh my gosh, what you can do together, you can move mountains together when you have that feeling of unity and belief. Um, and, and that's you know, one of the great lessons I learned about getting out of your comfort zone. Because you know what's on the other side when you're out of your comfort zone? There's magic on the other side, but you gotta get out of it. Right? So as much as I can, and this is what we do in the book, this is not an X's and O's book. Right? This is not a, a you know, I grew up in Orange County, autobiography, white kid in suburban Orange County. No, this is about how to get out of that comfort zone. And, and if I can be that voice or the amazing women in this voice could be that voice to say, yeah, you're going to be fine. Raise your hand. Go on. Go find that magic. And that leadership is personal, not positional. That's the huge one for me. That we all can lead is just figuring out what your style is. Are you a quiet leader like Mia? That's fine, right? But figure out what your style is and play true to that. Be authentically you, because I think we spend a lot of time trying to be someone else, trying to act like someone else, right? And I, I feel like it wasn't until my 40s that I started to go, you know what, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be me, and I'm going to be fine with that. And, and if they like it, they like it. And if not, who cares, really, right? And I want people to respect me, but I don't necessarily need them to like me. And that's like this 
feeling, an epiphany of freedom that you go, oh. And if we can pass that on and all of you in the room are doing that with your coaching or teaching in some capacity, pass that on to a young woman and a young man to say, just go be you, authentically, courageously, fabulously you, right? And figure out what your style is and bring back a smile and joy and laughter and say laughter is permitted in sports and life, then I think we're in a much better place as, as a community, as a school, as a team, and especially in this world. So I don't have my clock on me, Kim, so I'm going to, we good? I'm going to pull up my, I'm going to pull up my uh, sock talkers because I could talk for another 30. There's not a mic I don't like. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you get me going, you're never going to stop me. Kim's going to be throwing tomatoes from the back. <laughs> Come on. Okay, so um, I am so pumped. What we're gonna do, usually like, you know, you give the bios as they come up, but I find that to be kind of boring. Because when you read bios, it's like no one listens. So these guys are gonna give their bios. I'm just gonna give the short version of it. So, Erin Appleman, come on up, sister. Head coach of Yale Women's Volleyball Team. Oh, okay, I was, I got, I got, I was like, where are your socks, Erin? <laughs> Uh, Allison Guth, come on up, head coach, women's basketball team here at Yale. Oh, 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 sorry. Thank you. Um, I don't know, you couldn't tell by how awesome she looks, but Allison just got off a plane from Italy, by the way. Ciao, Ciao. Do any of you look like that after getting off a plane from Italy? Because I sure as heck don't. Dang. They call you like goose. Do you get that? Yes, that's it. Yeah. That's it. When, when, they, when I was doing your name, I, I automatically was a goose. They're not booing, they're saying goose. That's it. Thank you. Julie Pauly's calling my name. Yeah. I'm so excited. Patricia Melton, come on up. President of the nonprofit here, right here in New Haven. New Haven Promise. Also, at awesome track and field stud during her years here at Yale. Megan McMahon, come on up. Number one singles tennis player while at Yale. Yale women's head coach. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Megan. I know you're on the other side. Attica Jacks, come on up. VP of global, not national, global marketing at Under Armour. All right, rock stars. Two years, 
met my husband, now we're here in Connecticut, and so I keep moving further and further from my parents. Uh, I've been here at Yale for about 14 years, I uh, have won seven uh, ID championships. Yeah. marketing right out of school. I went to the University of Illinois where I played uh, golf and basketball. And I, when I got out of school, my dad was like, you really need to do this business thing. You've got to go that route. And I had worked at some uh, coaching clinics throughout my college undergrad and really loved it. But my dad said, you've got to put this degree to, to use. And so I ended up moving to Denver, Colorado. I was working in corporate America for a while. Um, working for Coca-Cola, North America. And so I get a call after I come home from a business trip from, uh, they flew us out and wined and dined us in Palm Springs and I was 21 years old and I couldn't believe I was living this life, it was awesome. And the culture of the company was cool, it was really vibrant and so I was getting back home from this uh, business trip and I got a call from one of my coaching friends who said, you know, I'm 99% I'm sure I'm gonna get this head job at Loyola University, Chicago, and I would love for you to be my recruiting coordinator and come work with me. And so I was like doing this little balancing act. I had just come back from the spa and the golf course. <laughs> um, and, and I thought to myself, well, what am I really doing with my life? I'm pretty much coking up the world one Coca-Cola at a time. <laughs> and, I, and that's what I'm doing. I'm basically a drug dealer. And, and what, could I do that or teach the youth of America in a sport I love? So I ended up turning in the company car, got myself a really cool bike that I rode around Chicago and, um, and and haven't turned back and, and I'm so so incredibly blessed to be here um, working at Yale and working for Tom I can't say enough about this place and how much this is family and home for me and when you're able to work for a leadership that believes in something like this in terms of uh, how we coach and what we do and he's one of my coaches in, in life right now so I'm really just proud to be here I'm just excited for this panel so oh, oh fun fact yeah I was gonna say Allison Goo. okay fun fact um, uh, fun fact I have two uh, different colored eyes that's a fun fact yeah oh, random really? yeah yeah they just yeah one's blue Ooh. one's green yeah and they're kind of like mood eyes I think what shirt I wear kind of brings it out more. So yeah, that's yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm Attica, both my eyes are brown. <laughs> and uh, I grew up in California and I actually played sports as well, not at a collegiate level, but I played basketball until my mom made me realize I wasn't gonna be any taller than I am now. <laughs> and I also ran track and field. I went to an arts high school where I majored in theater and dance. Then I went to UCLA. Um, for the most winningest years, uh, four years, 19 through 94. And then I moved to New York and had a career in advertising and marketing and really didn't look back since. So I felt I was able to put together my psychology background with an entertainment background and put it all together to doing, working with brands that I love and bringing them to life for consumers that I love. So I worked um, in Italy for Prada, which was an amazing story. Wow. Worked at yeah. Barney's. Worked Why at did you Gap. give up that job? <laughs> uh, and while I was at Gap, I really truly discovered that um, my passion was really working with women, working with youth, and doing it in ways that empowered us. So I was able to do that Gap. We did a couple of partnerships with Ellen DeGeneres. And then I got a call from Under Armour, and I thought how lucky I am to be able to put my personal passion with some of the skills that I've learned. And I've been at Under Armour for a little over a year. And Under Armour is a place that is run on pure passion and adrenaline and a strong point of view. Um, like being able to sign Yale has been uh, incredibly exciting. We also signed UCLA, which was also 
so exciting. Um, I also went to grad in Columbia. We haven't signed them yet, but we're, we're holding out. <laughs> so it's an honor and a pleasure to be on this panel, to be here, and to be here with uh, Julie Foudy, who is a true superstar on the Under Armour campus. Whenever she comes to campus, our teammates are just like, what? You got to meet Julie? Bodyguards. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you for having me. What's your fun fact, Anna? My fun fact? I think of a good one, maybe unexpected. It's uh, I met my husband in Tokyo, Japan, where we're both living. Oh, is he Japanese? He is not. <laughs> <laughs> I met my husband in Tokyo, and he is from Jersey. <laughs> that's that's so good for <laughs> in the public parks, and I came up to the competitive, unbelievably competitive, cutthroat, awful, solitary national junior tennis circuit, and um, had the great honor of being recruited to play tennis at Yale. And that was my first experience with playing on a team. So for all of the years I spent playing sports, and I, I loved I loved junior tennis, but it's you're alone out there. And so to come to Yale and play with a group of women, I loved and trusted and respected and worked with every day, um, that, that changed how I felt about sports. It changed how I felt about playing and it changed how I felt about um, carrying on with sports. So I finished at Yale um, and worked for the U.S. Tennis Association for two years and there's a theme here, but my father told me that I had to get serious and get a job that didn't involve tennis. So I enrolled in a Master's of Social Work program in Illinois at the University of Illinois in Chicago and I think probably there's going to be a lot of serendipity in our stories tonight, but um, mine is that the athletic director at the University of Illinois at Chicago heard there was a college tennis player on campus, and his women's tennis coach had just quit. And he said, would you be interested in coaching in exchange for, um, would you be interested in coaching the women's tennis team? And I said, I, you know, I told my dad I'm not going to, I've got to get serious. <laughs> and he said, I'll give you a tuition waiver. And so then I called my dad, and so I, that all worked out. So I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> so uh, two years later, I had a master's degree in social work and an absolute passion for, for coaching. And uh, I went on to coach at Columbia University in New York City and had the tremendous privilege of finishing my career uh, at Yale with my boss, Tom Beckett, uh, uh, and then... Uh, I left, I wasn't able to do the work-life balance the way um, Coach Aaron was, so I left to spend a little more time with my young children and um, then started a college consulting company for tennis players with my brother, which was also incredibly fun and rewarding. Um, and for the last seven years, I've been a full-time mom and family caregiver and volunteer. Awesome. So, my fun fact is that in fifth grade, I became absolutely obsessed with unicycles. And at the peak of my collection, I had five. And <laughs> one of them was six feet tall. And I used to ride them to school every day for three years. And I had one friend. <laughs> True story. I just did a shoot with this young track and field Olympian who um, on the side said she could juggle on a unicycle. And so I bought a unicycle for the shoot, thinking she's going to do this whole interview on a unicycle juggling. <laughs> and she's like, no, my coach won't like that. <laughs> so I went home with this unicycle. you got to get on that thing. I, They're fun. I, I have not done it yet, but I've been looking at it. <laughs> you, could, you could definitely do I've that. I've been obsessing, yeah. like, I need to get on that thing. OK, yeah. thank you. I'm going to do it. Great. Patricia. My name is Patricia Melton. I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, and I know everyone here is vote, uh, you know, rooting for that other team in the NBA Finals, but <laughs> LeBron. I, I, I'm a LeBron fan. So uh, I went to school. I got a scholarship, went to, to boarding school in, uh, in Massachusetts, and was very interested in actually playing sports because I came from an inner city school where I was actually cut 
and then went to Middlesex and I was able to play sports, all get exposed to all different sports, field hockey, lacrosse, basketball, all of that sort of wonderful stuff. So it turned out that, you know, in this little school I was able to really develop my skills, actually came to Yale uh, as a field hockey and lacrosse recruit. No way. Yes, yes way. Yeah. <laughs> How about but, that? When I got here, the coach wanted to do something that uh, he didn't tell me about, and that was put me in the goal. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's, that's not going to work. So I actually defected and was a walk-on in track and field and, wow. and did, you know, wonderful things there. But when I left Yale, I was very interested in exploring all sorts of things, and so just drove across the country to Seattle, Washington sight unseen, and landed in Tacoma and uh, Seattle, and was involved with the Goodwill Games. And if anyone knows anything about sports, Goodwill Games was this event that Ted Turner did to, uh, you know, really develop friendship between different countries after the 1980 boycott, right? Right. So that really exposed me to an incredible amount of, uh, you know, event management, just all sorts of things. Uh, and so I really took that passion and uh, contributed to education. So I was in Seattle uh, and working at the Urban League and College Access, and a group of teachers got together and decided that they would design a school, a school from scratch. I said, oh, you can do that? You can do that? And became involved, and that's really been my career, building schools throughout the Midwest, what we call early college high schools where kids uh, go to, particularly in urban areas, where kids go to school, get their uh, high school diploma and an associate's degree. They graduate with an associate's degree by the time, you know, they actually graduate. From there, I really was yearning to actually come back and be more involved with Yale. And so there was this incredible opportunity that I'm very proud of with my alma mater, and that is to uh, lead uh, a, a program called New Haven Promise. Basically, what does it look like when an entire city embraces its young people to college, through college, and helps bring them back to launch their career in civic lives? Well, guess what? My alma mater is actually doing something. They are investing awesome. millions of scholarship dollars, and I get to do the best job in the world. That's awesome. The That's best awesome. job. In the world. was a birthday gift to my sister. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so I was born on her birthday 13 wow. years uh, <laughs> later, so I was a gift to her. <laughs> and we had this special bond. Aww, <laughs> that's cute. Um, Patricia, let's start down there. It, in, in, it's interesting, as you guys talk about all the different phases of your careers, uh, when you look back and think about all the different skill sets required for the different things you've done, What's the one, you just have to pick one, you would say that is the reason you have been most successful at the different phases? Hmm, that, that's a good one. Uh, well, I've lived all over the country. I've had all sorts of different jobs, mostly in education. I, I would say uh, really being able to, to go into a community and uh, be able to adapt and really see challenges or opportunities from different perspectives. So I've lived in Seattle, I've lived in Phoenix, Arizona, I've lived in Cubbing, uh, uh, right across the Ohio River in Kentucky, northern Kentucky. I've, you know, I've lived in Indianapolis and all these different places, even though they're different, they have some really similar challenges. So really being able to go into a community and uh, get to know folks and, and really work with those folks to uh, you know, tackle challenges, so being adaptable and really being able to see perspective. I think that's been really critical. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Megan? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that it's a skill set, Julie, exactly, but, um, and I don't even like the word, but I think positivity. I, I think um, being able to recognize, even in failure and defeat, the good things that have come from it and um, what you did well and what you achieved even though maybe it didn't work out. So I mean, so many of us, we have these long lists of things that we did and I don't really look back on any of the things I did as not working out or I mean, I loved, I've loved everything I've done. Um, but it's, I love, right, Vince Lombardi, um, 
when he lost, I, David would know which game it was, but he lost some football game and he said, we didn't lose a football game, we just ran out of time. And I thought, that's the ultimate positivity, yeah. right? Like, you just, you, you being able to um, take the very best, and I think I learned that from sports. I mean, if, if you were ready to throw yourself off a bridge after you lost a match, you wouldn't keep playing. So being able to take what you've achieved and, and what you've done well and, and use that as a foundation to move forward, um, that's what's worked well. Yeah. In, in, in life, everything that gets thrown your way is a choice, right? I mean, and, and that's what I love about that. Success isn't a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. Leadership isn't a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. It's like the power when you realize, like, you decide that, right? And so I do think it's a skill set because you, you know, decide when an obstacle comes your way, which is, I think, a common trait amongst uh, successful people that I'm, I'm going to take it and learn and extract the lesson and, and move forward. So that's awesome. Attica? Yeah, I would probably say agility. I would go back and forth between agility and flexibility, but I think something about flexibility assumes that you don't have a foundation about what you believe in, and agility is staying with that foundation and being able to move fluidly. Um, I definitely feel like I've done that in my career. Um, Under Armour, for sure, is a place just because they're so built on innovation that every day, every minute, anything can happen. <laughs> so, um, so you build that skill set. I think everything that I've done up till getting the job at Under Armour sort of set me up for that kind of success. Right. Awesome. awesome. Hands down, mine is positive thinking. So it was the same. I, I just think that is the um, finding a way to shift the paradigm and and be real in certain situations. Obviously, in coaching. Um, at the end of the game, there are, there are wins, there are losses, but having a consistency about the way you approach it um, and, and that your players have that trust that they're going to have a consistency after a game. Um, we always approach the next day the same way in areas to improve. We get on the floor and we literally have a video. We'll go to, it'll be the first area of improvement. We'll go on the floor and practice that specific area of improvement. We go back to the film, we see the second area of improvement, and that's after a win or a loss. So it's not a feeling um, you know, associated with it. And I think if you're able to shift uh, that paradigm, I think positive, positive thinking is the biggest skill set. Yeah. Um, for me, I think um, it's probably the ability to get along with others and try to get a good read on what people need at that time. So in coaching, wins, losses, people have good games, bad games. You know, I think volleyball is probably one of the ultimate team sports because you can't, you can't hide. The ball is always going to find you. Um, and, you know, being able to, uh, there's so many people that make my, what I do, uh, you know, either easier or harder and being able to get along with everybody. A lot of my job is recruiting and, and talking with people. And I think, for me, that's one of my best skill sets. Right. Relationships. Ah. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's such a wonderful thing. Uh, when, when you talk about positivity, uh, has there been a time, though, in your career or lives where it, you know, you've really struggled with finding the positive? And this can be anyone, but I'll start with you, Megan. That you all of a sudden, because I, I think sometimes people think, oh, well, they're just positive people, right? Yeah. And they haven't had, or they haven't had the obstacles I've had, or they haven't gone through what I've yeah. gone through, right? But... Has there been a point where you were like, dang, I'm struggling here and I got to shake out of it? And how did you shake out of it? Yeah. Um, well, so, you know, I, I, here's my dad again, this old uh, Yale guy. Um, and ever since he's been a young guy, a young father at 40, I'd ask him how he's doing. Anytime I ask my dad how he's doing, he says, still vertical. <laughs> and I sort of, <laughs> there have been times in my life when that's like sort of where the bar is, right? Like, I'm still vertical, so okay, right? <laughs> um, you know, how do you get out of it? I, I think, gosh, I feel like I'm going to be really repetitive here, and maybe Allison and I will, will just be playing off each other, but um, I, I, I really don't, I don't think it's just constitutional, Julie. I really do feel that, that I have had to work on it, but um, I don't feel... Even at um, life's darkest moments, and there have been some dark ones, I, I feel a sense, I guess, of gratitude. Um, and, and maybe that's being positive, but I feel grateful for what I do have. Um, I feel grateful for the relationships I have. I feel grateful for um, 
you know, when, when I was coaching and, and we would lose a close match, I mean, I was thinking about you, I can't smile or talk about the Norway game in the World Cup. But, <laughs> but you know, I could tell you, but you had to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> the 2000 Olympics, we lost to them in the final. Norway, we call it white gold. That was the white gold medal. Yeah. <laughs> but, silver. You, even listening to you describe that, Julie, I mean, you know, the, it, it's, it's the, the um, ability even at, at your darkest time to, um, to find, I suppose, to find friends. Um, I have some wonderful friends in the room tonight uh, who have been me, with me through some of the hardest times. And, you know, I think if you don't feel alone um, and you feel yeah. that your attitude and your, um, your ability to get over things in the past will carry you through forward. Again, it's sort of this idea of a foundation. I mean, if you feel right. that you've you know, right. you've gotten over obstacles before, this might be the biggest one, but you just... And realizing you need help, right? Yeah. Sometimes, like having that team is huge. Yeah, that you're not alone. Yeah, Allison. Yeah, I, I would say leaning on uh, your support system uh, during the times where you're you're struggling. Um, I've never told anyone th this story. I think my the only person who knows is my wife, Jessie. But yes, uh, <laughs> I uh, I. Um, was I was going through a, a struggle with our team. Um, we ha we had a losing streak my first season uh, at Yale. We, we won a ton of games in the non-conference, started off hot, felt really good about going into conference play, and we struggled in conference play. Um, and, and you could tell it was a little between the ears um, and, and just our mental capacity of just attacking, but I felt like our team was bought in. But I got called down to Tom Beckett's office, and this was uh, this was a streak, a little bit of a streak. And so I, I was ready for like the pink slip to come across the table. Um, and I walked in, and I've never felt more. I, I walked out, smile. I came in just. I, I it's my first year, and I just I want to make everybody proud about the decision to be here and to take over our program. And I was so proud of where the program was because I believed in my. Uh, my coach, who, who I worked with here, Chris Gobrek. And so I wanted to just make her proud and make the, just, I just wanted success. And I wanted it too quickly, probably. Um, and I went into what, what I would consider my coach at Yale the office. And I'm just, Jen O'Neill is at the front desk. And I just look at her and I just, she smiles at me and gives me that hope. And I walk in and I'm just, oh, what's going to happen? And I will never forget, and I, I only told Jess this, that he sat me down and said that he had come to one of my practices, and he said, you are doing everything right. And he said, he, he literally said out of his mouth, and don't tell Gino this, but he, he said, you, I've seen Gino, what he does and how he connects with his players, and you are doing that right now. I said, did he just say Gino? I said, I gotta get a win, I gotta get a win, but he just said Gino. And I gotta tell you, he made me feel, just to have him in my corner and say, you know, you're doing it the right way, it shifted my entire, um, entire feeling walking out of there knowing that I had somebody in my corner like that. So I think it's, I think it's leaning on people. And then I would say, um, like you said, dark times are tough times. Um, I, I think I learned from the best. My, my wife, Jess, was going through, we got married, and she was 27 years old, and it was first year of marriage, and gets diagnosed with breast cancer. And the way she attacked it and the way that she crushed it, uh, it was all through positivity. And when we sat down with her surgeons and her doctors and all these people, they just said, you are rocking this out because of the way you're approaching it yeah. with, such, with, with such positivity. And so I truly, I don't think it is just one of those things you, t you say. You have to be real in moments, and there are tough moments, but when, you, when you're able to kind of sift through them uh, and, and really look at the light at the end of the tunnel, you just get there quicker. You get there a lot quicker. Yeah. So. There's, a, there's a woman we talked to in the book, Sue Inquist, who is 11-time national champion from UCLA. In softball uh, and she's just this phenomenal brain and woman and she says don't get stuck in your junk <laughs> you know like <laughs> junk's gonna happen right but you got to get up and you got to move um, and one of the things she says that I loved is like because I think often we, we say to kids especially like if they lost like it's okay it's okay you know and the other day my daughter who's 10 said um, I'm angry we lost and I said, good, now get over it. 
right? But it's okay. That emotion is a good emotion. But now let's flip it. Now let's turn it into, okay, how can I not feel that way again? But to feel it for a second and then carry on, which I think is a, is a one. But don't get stuck in your junk. I said, that should be a bumper sticker. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, Patricia, and did you have anything when you were younger, and Attica, you as well, and Aaron, you as well, so think about it, where you go, ah, now, now you know, but you wish you had known when you were in high school. Because, I don't know about you, but I was not at all awkward when I was in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I had hair that grew up, <laughs> literally, so I was afraid to grow it out, because I thought it would grow up. I'd wear big earrings, because everyone called me Jimmy. <laughs> and big padded bras. <laughs> I'm okay with that. I still wear them. <laughs> they look good, Jimmy. Thank you. <laughs> I went to this wonderful, small, little uh, supportive school in Concord, Mass, Middlesex School, uh, where their motto is fighting the promise in every kid, you know, in every kid. And so it's this great community. And, uh, you know, I can remember I, uh, when I first went there, coming from inner city Cleveland to, uh, uh, you know, Concord, Mass, this is a huge change. And we were uh, going uh, to see a, I don't know, some foreign language film at Concord Academy. And uh, of course, I hadn't said two words in the month that I had, you know, been there. And I was on a bus, and, and this amazing faculty member got on the bus, and uh, I, of course, wasn't saying anything. I was just grunting. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> but he, he just started talking to me, and it was like a lifeline. Uh, that he was able to throw out there. And, and from that, I was able to come out of my shell. So, you know, as I look back on that, it, it's really, uh, you, you know, when you're a young person, everybody wants to help you. I mean, everybody wants to help you. And you have that opportunity to be, uh, you know, help, you know, whether it's having a conversation because you're, you know, you're not confident, whatever it may be. And so take advantage of that. It doesn't matter if it's your peer or if it's a, a kind teacher or, if, you know, whoever it is. You know, you have that, that community around you that really wants to embrace you and lift you up and, and help you along. So that, yeah. that's really, I think, what in hindsight, you know, I wish I had done. And, and now be that person that then helps the young kid Absolutely. along, right? Absolutely. Which you're doing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I remember having a... A, an experience in high school where I went into camp, camp, not camp counselor, but the counselor's office. And so this is supposed to be a college counselor helping you what courses you're going to take to get you to college. And I remember listing out, these are the courses that I need to take. And she said, well, what college are you going to? Oh. And I almost, it stopped me in my tracks because I grew up, it wasn't about what, it wasn't about if you go to college, it was what college are you going to? from the day that I grew up. Um, I also grew up in Palo Alto, but this was in, in more of an inner city school in San Francisco. And I have to say to students, to people, that you have to choose your own path. And I think your book also does that. You have to choose success, you have to choose happiness, but you can't let someone else choose it for you. Right. Because had I been a different person, I'm sure I'm not the only person that she said that to. And there's probably a lot of people who could have had opportunities with the right support, but sometimes you have to be the one to choose that path. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just had a Shoot break it. drop out. <laughs> it's my clock. <laughs> we need a timer in the back. <laughs> um, I was not shy. I don't think I've ever been shy, and I was never awkward. So yeah. Uh, yeah. you were. Come on, give it to me. <laughs> now I think. Um, so, but I think. 
I think you really weren't awkward as a high schooler. No. What is wrong with you? Uh, I don't know. Um, That's uh, amazing. <laughs> That is so school, great. I had this. I have this young kid, sixteen year old, say to me, like, I'm, you know, I walk into a room and I'm comfortable in any group I'm in. I was like, oh my gosh, you harness that, sister, because that is not normal. Yeah, I'm not good public speaking, but I'm good in a room. It's awesome. So, um, great. But I think, you know, because of the players that I deal with and the the young women that I deal with, and I have um, my own children, you know, the one thing I would say is to high school, either you know, middle school or high school, be patient. Um, things are so much better a day later, and nothing needs to be done immediately. So I think in today, especially with the texting and the, yeah. everything is so immediately done, oh, I've got to get back to this, or I've got to do that, you know, just be patient. You're going to be mad after a loss if it's a, if it's a contest, but be patient. That'll go away, you know. Get yourself a good meal. Get yourself a good night's sleep. And things look so much better and more positive in the morning. But be more patient with the process. I know, you know, as a young coach, when I first started coaching, I was like up and raw and raw. And if you come to my games now, and Tom always laughs at me because I just sit there. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, nothing. You just pay me. I do nothing. <laughs> so but, but I, you just grow with more patience and understanding. And, and I think that's really important for young yeah young people and especially women to understand it doesn't have to be done right now. It can be done in a breath. You can breathe first. And so, you know, take that deep breath and figure things out. Yeah. And it also passes on like trust. Like I know you're going to get there. Yeah. I mean, like your calmness on the sidelines is like the best thing for a player. It's like, you know, how many of us have had coaches like, you know, or parents <laughs> screaming from the yeah. sidelines. I once had to be like, chill out, brother. <laughs> it's going to be okay. You're stressing us out right now. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like, sit down. <laughs> but it's so true. As, now, as a parent, I'm it's hard. much more stressful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I yeah. swore I wasn't going to be that parent on the sidelines. And then Izzy, when she was six or seven, which, you know, drove everyone nuts because how could I wait until my kid was six or seven to start playing soccer? I was like, how dare you wait until she's six or seven? And when she was in her first ever soccer game, you know, they get in that scrum and she didn't happen to be in the scrum and the ball popped out to her. And I was like, you take that ball and you run with it, AJ! And my husband was like... Uh, aging crazy soccer mom. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I am new. That's awesome. I just got so excited. She's out of the scrum. <laughs> now I like sit on the end and I don't say anything. Here, here. On that note, Allison, what do you what do you tell? What advice would you give to parents who? And, and I think it, it comes from a really good place, right? Parents, they want their kids to be successful, and they, they want them to have the best team to play on, and the best opportunity, and the best group to be a part of. But we end up suffocating the joy mm -hmm. in so much of what our kids are doing. So what advice would you give to parents to not just raise a successful athlete, not just an athlete, a kid, but a happy one? Mm. Um, I, you know, I think you touched on it a little bit earlier when you talked about putting the fun back into to sport and especially at a grassroot level and and sometimes you realize that even at a collegiate level I've, I've found that when we put the fun back into it and we just go out and play and trust the process we're so much better we play free and we're, we're better so um for a parent I would say am I Am I the only non-parent up here? No, no, no. Okay, awesome. Well, no, I like I how you kicked this to me. <laughs> I'm ready for this, but I'm ready I'm for it. I am ready. I hope to be a parent one day. And um, no pressure, I, yes. <laughs> but I, I would say that um, you know what, I, what I relate to uh, for for coaching my relationships with our our, our players, coaches, as well as uh, going through my own life in terms of my favorite and best coach was my father. And when I started playing in second and third grade, they didn't have any um, they didn't have any girls youth leagues, and so I played with the guys from second through sixth grade. So he kind of took it on himself to be the coach. And um, as I, I think most parents, they're they're hardest on their own. Um, and I think finding a way uh, to really 
tra it translate the constructive criticism because at the end of the day, I hear a lot of parents say, oh, they don't want to hear it from me. I, have, I'll, I just had three official visits last week and the, and the you know, I get together with dad at the end of the night and he said, oh, the th stuff you told her about what she's got to do with her mid-range game, I've been telling her that for the past month. She's not doing that for that. And he'll take me aside and talk to me. And so I think the understanding of usually for, for your children, for parents out there, their biggest fear in life is disappointing you. And so when they hear something that you think is just a constructive criticism about man, you got to finish with your left, or you're not sprinting the floor, or I don't see you working on the boards, they go to immediate failure and disappointment. And finding a way to be constructively critical and help them with whatever you were trying to teach them coaching-wise, and I'm, I know I'm speaking primarily to athletics, but this can happen with, with academics in the classroom, all sorts of things. Um, finding a way that at the, the, the beginning of it, the end of it, it's because you totally believe in them, that they have this potential. Mm -hmm. And I think that belief um, would be the best thing because when someone believes in you, it's, it's, a, it's a really powerful thing. So that's, that, mm -hmm. that would be my suggestion. That's great. That's, that's awesome. My mom was the best at like I'd have a terrible game. My mom knew nothing about soccer, and she'd be like, "Honey, I just thought you kicked that ball so well." <laughs> <laughs> and I still like to this day. I'd be like, "Mom, what position did I play?" I don't know. <laughs> That's just amazing. There's like there's such a like a, a ignorance is bliss kind of joy to like your parents not knowing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Uh, but supporting, I love that. Um, Megan? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose so. I'm on the other side of it with parenting and had a couple of, uh, both of my children play competitive sports. I mean, I, and you talk about this in your book a lot, Julie. I, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm going to say this, and I'm not sure that I actually followed it as a parent, <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say what I aspire to do, which is to encourage my kids to hit a personal best instead of having them set up to constantly be competing against the person on their right or their left. So if they can go out and feel every day like they were their own best today compared to, you know, it doesn't have to be yesterday, but compared to last week, or compared, that, that they are getting better and that that's their benchmark, that I, I still have my best day ahead of me because I think I think a lot of times, especially kids and teenagers, tend to get out on the court with, you know, really great, really elite athletes, and, and, and that's who they pick out. And they say, oh, I'm never going to be that good. And then all of a sudden, it's like, well, but so then how do you feel like you've achieved anything? Maybe you might not be, right. but then how do you feel like you've achieved? So I, I, I would like to think that... Um, I would like to think that I do it, but if I were giving advice, I would I say that. personal best. Yeah, that's great because it's so true. Like, oh no, I can't. I don't have that. I can't be that person. That's a that's a common refrain you hear from kids. That's great. I love that. I'm taking that home. I'm gonna try it. Um, Attica, speaking of, of messaging, uh, you guys at Under Armour came out with an awesome campaign recently. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Uh, it's called I'm Pretty. And, and it's not what you think when you see I'm pretty, hashtag I'm pretty. It's not just like, I'm not just a pretty face. I'm pretty tough or I'm pretty smart. I'm pretty brave. And they had people fill in the blanks, which was so cool. How, how and I know Under Armour does a ton of uh, research and studies about the impact of that messaging, especially on young girls. What have you found in your, your time at Gap and both with Under Armour with that, the power of that? Yeah. Um Interestingly enough, a lot of it comes from insights that we have from our athletes. <clears throat> and we were, we're getting ready to launch a women's campaign this fall. And we were meeting with some of our elite athletes. And Lindsey Vaughn, for example, said that she had won her first gold medal, was getting all of these interviews. No one ever asked her about what it felt to win her gold medal. They just wanted to know what she was wearing, her boyfriend like everything else but her achievement. And we kept hearing the story sort of over and over. And we started seeing some of the challenges that women in sport have that men don't always have. Mm. Um, and, and we wanted to provide an opportunity for not us to say, 
what it is, but taking the words I'm pretty and owning it, but you kind of deciding and, and um, turning it on its head and just changing the paradigm there. So we honestly launched it as like a one day International Women's Day. Let's just have you know a moment that we give we give our consumers to talk about themselves and celebrate each other. And it's still going. It's still going. People are making videos. Um, we have men wearing I'm pretty. We had uh, the head of basketball who's on the brand team. So we work side by side. And he's been the biggest champion of some of the work that we're doing in women's. And he said, I wore my I'm pretty shirt this weekend. And I was out in the harbor. And everyone's like, yes, you are pretty. Yeah. <laughs> So it's, um, it's taken a life of its own, but I would love about it. It's a life of its own that people are owning for themselves. That's awesome. Cool. Cool. It's That's great. So awesome. Very cool. Uh, my last question, and then we're going to open it up for you guys all to ask a few questions, and then we're going to get you back for the Cavs Warriors game. Go Cavs! <laughs> <laughs> I know you guys are going, what time is it? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, we, we end the book because so much of... of the messaging is leadership is personal, not positional, and finding your style is, I have all the women in the book, in one sentence, no run-ons allowed, leadership is. Uh, so, Patricia, let's start with you, darling. Good uh, Leadership is... Um, A quality that everyone has to tap into, to uh, be able to build, um, you know, whatever that goal is, to you know, enhance your life, your mission, your goal, your team, your you know, your love, of, your love life, whatever it is. That's what leadership is. <laughs> to unleash that awesome. <laughs> and, yeah, definitely. Great, Megan. Um, I think leadership is giving your um, whatever you have to give, but mostly your time, your ear, your attention, your focus, being able to ask how are you and really mean it and listen. You know, that is so I important too because, That's really yeah, because I think a lot of young kids too think that um, leadership or is, is I have to raise because they see Taylor Swift do it or Katy Perry do it. I have to raise this amount of money and I have to be a superstar again. And they think it's all about treasure. We call it the three T's, right? Time, treasure, talent. Instead of thinking about it as I, I'm just going to help someone. That's, that's leadership. That's giving. That's empowering someone else by helping them. So that's a great one. I love that. So following very similar lines, but I, I believe leadership is not about getting power, it's about giving your power. Oh. <laughs> Snap. <laughs> that, that is awesome. <laughs> I like that one. Beat that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what she said, I like it. <laughs> I'm taking what Atticus said. I'm taking it. I'm writing Double it down. down. Uh, I, I would say leadership is love and trust. I would say those two things, love and trust. Love it. Yeah. I was going to say selfless. So it's very similar, giving, giving time, giving encouragement, giving love. That's Leadership selfless. is selfless. That's awesome. Um, do you guys have some questions for our fine sock talkers in the front? They have a mic. <laughs> oh, we do have a mic. Or I'll just sing karaoke for the next five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> With that mic. Summer loving. <laughs> Happy of last. Someone ask a question. <laughs> Summer loving. <laughs> Wait for them to let me know what sports they want to play. I'm gonna try everything. What What are your thoughts on that? You coaches as, want to start as a mom uh, who has a daughter's played six or seven sports in her time, um, and my husband's also a coach, so my kids her crystal. It's got to be tough. But um, <laughs> so we didn't start either of our children very young, to be honest, and we wanted them to try 
a lot of things, and a lot of things they got into because their friends were into it. So, um, you know, she ended up playing lacrosse because she was at a sleepover at a friend's house who was at a lacrosse practice. She did it in rain boots, and then, you know, $300 later, she was playing lacrosse. <laughs> but uh, I was laughing at my friend, and then I, yeah. So, um, but, you know, I think playing, you know, and, and in, in our world, because we recruit older kids, that you have to eventually choose a sport. I love the fact that both of my children have tried different sports, and, and then we found the one that she really likes, because it's the only thing she does on her own. So that's how we figured out what, what it was. And that was in eighth grade, so it's older. And I think expose them to, you know, open the doors. I think my parents were really good about just like opening doors and then you get to choose, you know, which ones you want to kind of race through. And, and, they'll, and they'll find it, you know. I, I early on was told by my father, this seems to be a theme, that <laughs> tennis is the way to go. <laughs> no kidding. And they're like, that's where the money is. And tennis, I was terrible at. And I was like, I don't like this sport. I was much more into team sports because I was, you know, social and I needed that energy off teammates and I didn't want the individual sports, but that was me. Um, and so that's what I ended up gravitating to. But you'll you'll find it along the way. But you always hear these super interesting stories like Ibtahaj Muhammad, who is this amazing US Olympian fencer who came to fencing really late in her, you know, in high school. Um, and now she's on the Olympic team and you know, and she just got introduced to it and, and there you go. She she ran through that door. So passion. Yeah. And I think early exposure. I four and seven they're little, but early exposure to a lot of things is great, but um, just Funny story about my mom, but um, my mom was a real tennis mother, sort of classic 1970s and 80s tennis mother. And by seven, I was playing seven days a week, three hours a day. And so fast forward now, when my son was about eight or nine, he started to play tennis, and he played a lot of other sports too. He was, he was pretty good, and my mom came out and watched him play, and she said, he should be playing every day. And I said, well, I don't think he wants to play every day. And she said, you don't ask. <laughs> and, I, Stop. and I said, <laughs> I thought in that moment, I, you know, I probably shouldn't have asked, but I'm glad I did. And now he's playing basketball. He doesn't like tennis. And he's like, you know, so. Yeah, that's a great one. Yes. Um, as both coaches and moms, how do you deal with or how do you combat uh, the issue that um, I've seen a lot um, both in college athletics um, and in the, the program that I work for now that works with girls fifth grade through senior year of high school and then on into college. How do you combat uh, the sort of fear that seems to be instilled in girls of being strong? Both physically, like, you know, tough to get girls into the weight room in, in college athletics and also mentally and emotionally like asserting themselves both in sports and in life yeah that's a great question yeah. i think it's I'll, I'll start by i think it's the 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 culture you set and it's the the words you use and the descriptive words and that's why i think this campaign that under armor has done is so powerful um, because it redefines what what is beautiful and and I think uh, when you treat your females just like what they want to be treated as, it's as athletes, athletes, period. And so I think when you approach them as athletes and you talk about, um, you know, we're very fortunate, obviously, at collegiate level to have a strength and conditioning coach and a nutritionist and, and people that are reinforcing these words that we're using to describe um, what is needed to be at your peak performance as an athlete. Um, people want that. So, so, so body goals end up being things that are celebrated that they see around them that have to do with strength, that have to do with what's going to give them an edge on the court, the field, you know, whatever it be. Um, and I think the only way you can do that is within your culture about how you talk, how you're celebrating those things, um, and then hope it, hope it trickles out. And, and that's, that's what we do um, for our athletes. Um, I had a player who was, she was 6'3", and she was probably 6'1 in 7th grade. So she was really tall. And she ended up writing her Yale essay on 
how volleyball gave her confidence because she used to walk around and was kind of ashamed being tall. And but when she started playing volleyball, everybody valued her height. And all of a sudden, her shoulders went back, and she now wears heels, and she's 6'8 places. I don't know. <laughs> but she's, like, it gave her so much confidence playing the sport because of what her physical attribute, just that, that not, obviously that's not lifting or anything, but just what her physical attributes are. So I think definitely you can find a lot of confidence through sports um, in that sense too. So I thought, I thought that was really an interesting article because we tell them not to write about volleyball. <laughs> but I guess this wasn't, it was about confidence. So We have an athlete that we just signed very confidentially. Um, who is very non-traditional. She's a stunt woman, she was a collegiate athlete, and she was told as she was in auditions that she was too strong, too big. And she's like, but I'm the one that actually has to jump out of the building and <laughs> into a car and doing these things. And it's been really important for us and for me, even on a personal level, to show <laughs> women who are strong and um, who are living their dreams. She actually said she wanted to be a superhero, and she's actually living her dream. And that's to be seen as positive because of what they can achieve. So um, we need to see more of that so that girls don't feel that being strong is bad or wrong or not something that they want to achieve. And that it's not just physical, right? It's not just muscles. It's not. It's strong a heart, strong a mind. I mean, I, I would take... You know, as a teammate or a friend, you know, someone, the first person I would pick was someone I knew who, without a left leg or a right arm, you know, I got their mind and their mentality and they're strong and they're never going to stop fighting. Like, that's strength to me. So, but I agree too with Allison is, is you know, as, especially as parents and coaches, you, yeah, I try to be so conscious of, you know, it's very normal sometimes for women to look in the mirror and how often did your mom go like, oh, I feel fat. Or look at my thighs. And you're kind of saying it to yourself, but your kid is there, right? And so being super conscious about just those kind of you know, signals you're sending and that type of messaging, uh, which I think we get stuck in sometimes, of just being super conscious. I never want to say that in front of my kid, even if I feel like my muffin top is hanging over my belt. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, last question, probably? Is that, or is that, are you telling me I'm done, Kim? No, I'm telling you, I have a question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that just cut me off. <laughs> so in your book, which, by the way, is for sale tonight, Julie has signed a lot of books, so we hope that uh, you will feel comfortable checking out at Silent Auction and buying one of her books. Um, in your book, you interview a number of women who are um, wonderfully powerful and demonstrating of great leadership. I'm, I'm fascinated that you chose somebody with cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. uh, having a child with a disability, I was so tickled to see that. And um, Jay Carlson uh, and I work with Unified Sports and their, te their teammates and their athletes and partners, and we know that they demonstrate leadership as well. So how did you come around to uh, meeting this young lady and mm -hmm. picking her for your book. Well, it's, it's funny because, you know, Disney Publishing and ESPN, who are the two who did the book with me, you know, when we're going through the list of people we wanted in the book for women, um, I kept coming back to Amy Liss is at the top of my list. And they're like, who's Amy Liss? And I said, exactly. You don't know Amy Liss yet, but you will know Amy Liss after you read her story because... The important thing is she doesn't need to be a celebrity. She doesn't need to be a superstar. But the way she approaches life uh, with this disability, which she was born with, when I met her, it just struck me like, oh, my gosh, she has every right to complain and to um, be down if she's not feeling well that day. And yet she is one of the most <coughs> joyful, positive people I know, filled with gratitude. She actually has above her bed every morning it says, uh, live each day with an attitude of gratitude. That's what she wakes up to. It's a quote above her bed. Um, and we met Amy Liss at our leadership academies, and we do a day of service at the leadership academies because the whole messaging of the book as well is not just to empower yourself to be awesome and be a great leader, but the real mission is then to go out and empower others, right? And that, to me, is the greatest form of leadership, is this service you're giving to others by lifting them up. Um, 
But Amy, every day when we would do the same community service at this local Easter Seals, which is a group that, uh, a national group that um, helps patients and kids and adults with disabilities, Amy would be in her little Julie Foudy Sports Leadership Academy t-shirt, in her wheelchair with a big smile, mm -hmm. and she would take the kids on a tour. And the thing with Amy is with her cer severe cerebral palsy, you know, she, she has her limbs, she can't walk on her own, of course, she can't eat on her own. She's very stiff because of the cerebral palsy. And the kids would be really hesitant to come up to her, her at first. But then when she would talk to them, and she was, she's funny as heck, she's super dry, she's sharp as heck, then all of a sudden they got her humor and they got her, her, her way and they loved her. And it took me five years before I finally said, Amy, why aren't you working with us at this Julie Foudy Sports Leadership Camp? Why, why aren't you with us for the week? And she looked at me and she goes, have you had a heat stroke? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a wheelchair. <laughs> How am I going to do this? I was like, what do you mean? You are going to be like the most inspirational thing to these kids when they get to know you. And without fail, every evaluation that comes back from all the kids, the highlight of the week is Amy Liss, right? And the power of what she passes on. And she didn't quite realize the gift she has and her personality and her positivity. And now she's out speaking at schools and she's passing it on. And it's just, I love it because it's a story that needs to be heard. She's not a superstar. She didn't have leadership training. She's just someone that chooses to live positively and pass it on. And people need to hear that. So that's how we came to, to Amy is she became a real part of the family. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and on that, can we please give these amazing women a round of applause? And to Tom and Kim and Yale for and PCA for believing in something and then not just believing in it but then passing it on to others Tom is a beautiful thing so thanks for what you have been doing for so many years and passing we'll on that positive <laughs>